Good evening and welcome to the Bethany Baptist Church Midweek Connection Point. Our desire is to give you a, a little bit of energy and spiritual revival midway through the week before you're able to watch our services on Sunday uh, or gather with us in person. I trust many of you are reading the Word every day, but it's always good to see others' faces, to hear from other brothers and sisters in Christ, and to just come to the Word together uh, and to respond in song. So tonight we'll do all three of those things, plus uh, revive another thing we've done in the past. Uh, so first we'll hear from one of the brothers I miss the most in our um, in-person gatherings. Brother Steve Masson is going to share with us about the importance of the local church and why we should be a part of and covenant as members. Uh, and then I want to revive our evangelism encounters. We did that every Wednesday before we were uh, dismissed for quarantine. Uh, quick devotion in the Word, and then we'll sing Be Thou My Vision with our song leader, Jordan Begley. So I hope you'll stay tuned for the 30 minutes or so and be encouraged tonight. Good evening. My name is Steve Maston. My wife is Michelle. My son is James. We are attenders here and members of Bethany Baptist Church. How long have you been going to church? When was the first time you went to church, and how many years do you think maybe you've been going all together? We've been coming to Bethany since 1997, best I can remember anyway. Michelle and I have. Of course, James, for his nine years, has been here. Uh, I have been in church somewhere all my life. Uh, I've been in the Baptist, been attending Baptist Church since I was 16 years old. So I have a lifelong history of being in church. Why do you think that God invented the local church? Of all the ways that God could spread the gospel, in His wisdom, He understood that the best way to spread that gospel is through the local church. He told the disciples that they were to begin to spread the gospel in Jerusalem and Judea and to the uttermost parts of the earth. He established, I believe, the local church because that's where things start. Our mission money goes around the world. But we start right here in our homes and in our communities. And one of the reasons God established the local church was so that we would come together and we would work together to win our families, to win uh, our community, our co-workers. And in a local church, we come together and we encourage one another to do that. We in a local church watch over one another in as much as if we, if I begin to stray, there's any number of people that's going to come to me and say, what are you doing? We watch over one another's soul. We have a, a, a fellowship that is stronger than would be if God had not given us the local church. So the local church is the vehicle by which uh, the gospel is spread. And God could have done that in many different ways but he chose the local church to spread the gospel. Do you think that someone can be a Christian and still grow in their faith without being a part of the local church? Hmm. Not very well at all. Um, the old illustration of the two men sitting by the fire, and uh, the one was trying to convince the other to go to church. And he was saying, I don't need to. Hmm. So the one gentleman reached over to the fire with the poker and pulled a, a coal out on the hearth. And as they continued to talk, after some time, he reached over and picked the coal up with his fingers and said, when you get out of the fire, you get cold. And so it is with the church. If you're trying to go it all by yourself, uh, you're not going to have the encouragement. You're not going to have the accountability. You're not going to. You, you can read your Bible. You can pray. But we need to share in the Word together. It needs to be taught to us. It needs to be preached to us. We need to share it with one another. So no, you're not going to prosper very well outside of the local church as a child of God. Furthermore, I believe that if you're a child of God, God's going to lead you to church. You want to be with God's people. What would be a benefit of being a part of a, a local church that's smaller? So we have large churches in Bowling Green and smaller churches. I think Bethany's probably on the small end. What would be a particular benefit of being a part of a small church? Hmm. You know everybody is one benefit. Uh, when we gather here at Bethany, even if it's a large crowd, we pretty well know everyone. And the advantage is if we don't, we will before we leave. So a small church does that. Uh, the fellowship in a small church uh, 
is, is a sweet fellowship because there again, everybody knows everybody. You have the opportunity to interact one with another more than in a larger church. Uh, uh, you just have a different feeling about being brothers and sisters in Christ in a smaller church. Not knocking larger churches. There are some that have some fantastic uh, small groups and some fantastic gatherings. But a small church, it's, there's just an atmosphere and there's just a fellowship and a spirit that you don't find anywhere else. Many people would say that church is only for the weak Christians, but uh, as you get more mature in your faith, you're able to kind of stand on your own. I think that's interesting, especially considering that you've been a pastor for many years and you are very sharp in the Word of God and evangelism. Uh, how would you tell someone gently that they are wrong to think that only weak believers need the local church? How, how do weak believers become strong believers? By being in the church, by being in Sunday school, by sitting and listening to the preaching of the Word of God, by singing and having fellowship one with another by being held accountable by their brothers and sisters, accountable in love. That's how a weak Christian becomes a strong Christian. And so, to say that only the weak need to come, yeah, if, if a person is a weak Christian, they do need to come. And they need to be working toward being that strong Christian. But, a strong Christian that tries to step away from the local church and go it on their own, does two things. They short themselves of the gospel. They short themselves the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. They short themselves the fellowship that is so desperately needed in a Christian's life. And they also fail to give those things to maybe those who are weaker in the church. A strong person needs to be in church so that they can share what they know and they also need to be in church so that they stay in a correct relationship with God. None of us are strong enough if you take us out of church. And right now we're, we're having to do online sometimes. We're having to do different things. But if you take us away from that fellowship and you take us away from that local church, none of us are strong enough to go it alone. No matter how strong we think we are. We need the church. If, if I be considered a strong Christian, and many times I say, as Paul, I'm the weakest of the whole bunch. But I need to be a church. I need the preaching of the Word of God. I need the gospel to hear it again and again, even though I'm saved, so that I can tell it to others. The strong need the church very much. How would you coach someone to get the most out of their Sunday morning attendance? Maybe some things that you do as you come into church or the night before or while you're here. How can they maximize what they soak up and get from the local church? In no particular order, but somewhat of an order. Make a commitment to be in church. Don't let it be a halfway commitment. Well, for not doing anything else, we'll go. Don't say, I'll probably go every other Sunday. Make a commitment to be in church that you're going to be there every time you can. Make that commitment. That's one thing. That's how things start if you're going to get a lot out of church because it's just no question. You just get up and go. Um, as a child, there was no question we were going to church, and we did. And my mom and dad taught me that. And certainly... Uh, when I became a Christian, I realized why they taught me that. So first thing is make a commitment to be in church. Second thing, be in the Word of God so that you understand the purpose of church and why you're there. Uh, we have the benefit here at Bethany of expository preaching. We pretty well know what the next scripture is going to be. Study it. Read it. Even if your week is terribly busy, take a few moments and read it and know where you're going to get something out of it. Where that when pastor's preaching, you're saying, yeah, I read that. I read that. Mm -hmm. Pray. We all have things in life that on Sunday morning don't go right, but try to come with a decent attitude. 
and participate. It's not a spectator sport. Mm -hmm. Sing, pray, Follow along in, in, in the scripture while it, the preaching is going on. Be in Sunday school. If you want to get something out of it, put something in it. Mm. And expect God to bless. Because mm. He wants to. He wants to bless us as we gather together in His church. How do you think things are going at your local church right now? How are things at Bethany in this uh, season of life? One cannot argue against baptisms which we have seen. Uh, one cannot raise objections to visitors coming and new people. One can say nothing against the spirit of love and the spirit of determination to serve the Lord. Uh, the truth is being proclaimed in Sunday school. The truth is being proclaimed from the pulpit. Our singing is to the Lord. We are encouraged not only by pa our pastor, but we're encouraged by one another to reach out with the gospel. People are in in in, uh, in holding. I'm going to use myself for an example in holding me accountable. Hey, how's it going? How are you doing on witnessing to people? Have you been able to share the gospel? I think those things are, are signs of a church that is doing well, a healthy church. Uh, when we see that people are having more and more and more concern about sharing the gospel, and it's, it's the buzz in the congregation. It's not just, well, pastor says we should. It's more of a, we need to be sharing the gospel because people need Jesus. Uh, we're given to missions. We're looking for opportunities to serve. So in that sense and through the years and being in different churches, I've seen some that are pretty sick. I've seen some that are uh, just getting by. I've seen some that have gotten a foothold and are going forward. That's where I believe we are. We're certainly going forward in the kingdom of God. All right, in closing, anything else you want to say about uh, the local church or to your church family? Hmm. I love all my church family very much, and I miss being here with you. Um, continue to, and I've, I've always appreciated the fact that everybody says, hey, whether you can be here or not, you're still a part of the family and a part of the church. We understand those who for... Uh, health reasons, whatever, cannot be here. And I appreciate that so much. So keep that up for everybody, reaching out, uh, letting people know that uh, they're cared about and loved, and uh, just keep on keeping on what you're doing. Hope you enjoyed that. I'm so thankful for Steve Masson. He does not just preach uh, the local church. He lives it out. Steve is here every time the doors open. He's one of our, if not most faithful, regular attenders to God's Word. I love looking out and seeing his face attentively uh, listening and his amens uh, that he gives out from time to time and singing and being a part of the bride. Uh, thankful for each and every one of our members I hope you're feeling connected even through the, the video tonight and maybe shoot him an encouraging message uh, or something that stuck out to what he said uh, for you specifically. So before we go to our devotion tonight, I know for a while we did uh, book recommendations and I kind of exhausted the main topics there. Uh, I want to get back to doing our evangelism encounters and I was provoked um, by this tonight or today, a couple of things that happened. Every Wednesday night, as uh, Steve was mentioning earlier, one of the signs that we are growing as a healthy church is it's not just the pastor evangelizing or a select few, but many of you have been sharing uh, ways in which you would engage lost people, neighbors, coworkers with the gospel, and I miss that. Uh, one of my favorite moments each Wednesday night. So I want to just hopefully uh, revive your concern for that by sharing one with you today. Uh, in fact, this morning I met with about seven other uh, real solid pastors here, Baptist pastors in our community, and we went around a circle and shared things that um, have been tough in <clears throat> the time of quarantine. And there are many tough things, uh, not being able to be with church family and trying to pastor and account for sheep that you can't see every week. But I think 
honestly, personally, one of the things that I have missed the most is being able to evangelize, uh, to talk to students in the thousands at Western's campus, to engage people without a mask and not have to social distance, but just ta- I miss talking to people who do not yet know about Jesus. Um, it's one of my main reasons why I pray that God would lift this uh, quarantine and would provide a vaccine for us. I love the church. I love you guys, and it is my delight to pastor you, but I, I, I want to see those who don't know Jesus come to know and to share in this treasure we have. And so even as I was leaving this meeting, one of the pastors called me up and asked um, how I've been able to engage lost people, uh, maybe to get some pointers, and um, I didn't really have any good answers. Uh, it is difficult, and so I think we need to, when we do see people, we need to not pass on opportunities when we see people in public. And so ironically, when I hung up with this brother, I was going into a new uh, bank, a new financial institute, um, seeking a, a new credit or a, a new account there, uh, maybe switching banks. That's another story for another day. But I sat down with the uh, gentleman there and began to apply for a new checking account there. And uh, this individual, will call him Ken, he had to ask me what I do for a living. And so I said, uh, I'm a pastor of a church, and, which was an immediate, easy way to ask him, do you go to church anywhere? Friends, that's one way we can always engage the, the lost or anybody we meet. Maybe they already are a member of a church. Just ask, do you go to church anywhere? Or do you have any spiritual background? This person immediately and kindly admitted that he had no place in his life for organized religion, did not even believe that there was a God. And so immediately just... Instead of shutting down or getting angry or fighting with him, I like to ask questions to honor this person's history, the background. Maybe someone's hurt him in church before, so I just ask them, is it that you don't like organized religion? Has someone hurt you from the church, or you just don't believe in God? And he said, to be honest, I, I don't believe in God. I don't see evidence for him, and I think it's a, it's a man-made thing to kind of corrupt or to control people. Um, so I, I listen, uh, and, and as we're... Given, gathering more information about myself and register me for this account, I'm thinking of ways that I can talk uh, to him uh, ab- about this. And um, one thing that I, I practiced this morning that I would encourage you in is when someone is honest enough to admit to you that they don't believe that there's a God, you should encourage them. And this is what I mean. Especially me as a pastor, when people find out I'm a pastor, I feel like they really tend to clean up their act or to at least be agreeable about religion. So for this person to know that I'm a pastor and say they don't even believe that there's God or evidence for it, that could offend me. And, and that person could try to please me. He said he said the truth. So I just praised Ken. I said, Ken, man, thank you. I, I said, many people probably deceive or try to lie to me because I'm a pastor. Thank you for being honest. So you acknowledge them that they are a thinking person, even if you disagree with them, and you encourage the dialogue to continue rather than to come to a stalemate. That is something that our culture, and my generation in particular, is not good at. That if we disagree with each other, we just shut each other down, or we yell, or we run away. We should encourage conversation with people that we disagree with. Try to understand where they're coming from uh, and, and, and bridge uh, bridge things that we do have in common. So I encourage them. So there's knowing that Ken does not believe that there is a God. He said he was atheist, maybe more agnostic. Here's a question that I asked him that I would encourage you to ask people when you run into those who don't believe in God, which are not very common in our community, but are very common throughout the world and growing. So this will be a helpful question for you. I asked Ken, I said, okay, let's say there was a God and he existed and he was true, what would he have to do to prove his existence to you? What would he have to do? So here again, instead of me just telling him, here, here's why I believe in a God, there is a God, you you fool, I can't believe you don't believe in a God. Ask them what God would have to do to prove himself. So what that does, that gets them thinking. It shows that I'm reasonable and that God is, is a reasonable person as well or being. And so they might say a miracle or to fix something in their past or for them to have an experience of God or to see him in nature. And I guarantee you with this friend who was listening very well in our conversation, he's going to leave our meeting today and go throughout this week and he's going to be wondering, okay, I didn't believe there was a God, but someone came and challenged me to think, what would it take for him to reveal himself to me? And can't even admit, he said, that's a good question. I've, I haven't thought about that. And so... We trust that God can reveal himself to these people, 
um, through the preaching of his word, through providence, through anything, any sign in creation that could get them thinking that way. So you're just kind of opening the door for them to even be looking for the existence of God. And so Ken went on to say, you know, I, I don't really believe in miracles and that really wouldn't prove it. And so really, I, I, I don't care. And, and so I challenged Ken. I said, Ken, well, wouldn't you, don't you think you should think about it a little bit, a little bit more? I said, it's not like you're just trying to decide where should you invest your money for a couple of years. The answer to the question I just asked you or the existence of God could determine eternity, millions of years. So it is worth pursuing more than pursuing a, a better bank or a better financial investment. So you're just challenging them with uh, the possibility of God. I told Ken that I'm not trying to get him to go around first, second, and third base, not even to believe and or not even to follow the God I believe, but just to get on first base first base to even believe there is a God, and then to decide, like the people who rejected Jesus, whether or not they would follow him. So we're just trying to make uh, baby steps and encourage good spiritual conversation. So uh, that's as far as I made it with Ken. Uh, The good news is is I'll be taking Meredith back there soon to open up an account, uh, another account for our family. And so I know exactly who I'm going to ask for when I need help and I go to that bank. Uh, I'm going to ask for Ken. I'm going to be thinking. As I drove away, I was praying that God would do the things that I wanted him to do in Ken's life, to make him think about God, to pursue God, to feel the weight of eternity. Um, And I hope to be more prepared. And so I just tell you that evangelism encounter to encourage you to take advantage of the few opportunities where you see people at restaurants, uh, at the gas station, when you go to the bank, uh, to maybe go inside with your mask on instead of just making your deposit electronically or from the window. But evangelism opportunities are going to be few and far between right now. Let's not miss them. And let's kind of navigate our life to get back there. We have the good news of the gospel. I believe that God is good and wants to reveal himself to Ken and has already, I believe, but wants Ken to turn from his sin and to follow and trust in Christ. So hope you're encouraged by that to evangelize. And if you've got an evangelism encounter you want to share, why don't you videotape yourself with your phone uh, about how you shared the gospel or had a religious conversation with someone who doesn't believe in God and send that in and maybe I can put it in on next week's video. So let's quickly do a devotion from God's Word. This is from my own quiet time. My family and I are actually reading through Romans and we read Romans chapter 12 last night. So if you want to turn to Romans chapter 12 verse 3, I want to encourage all of you who are in Christ um, Specifically, from Romans twelve chapter, Romans chapter twelve verse three. It says this: For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who acts, uh, who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So two simple and very brief points I want to get from this text. Uh, Paul is now dealing with the practical aspect of the doctrine he's been dealing with in our Sunday morning series and what is the gospel and how are we made righteous according to faith. The back end of Romans is way more practical, so it's easy for devotions, easier for preaching, and probably more enjoyable day to day for many of you. Uh, So he's talking to the church here. I need to establish that first. These spiritual gifts and this faith that is given is to those who are saved. So First, ask yourself, are you in Christ? Why have you not turned from your sin, turned from loving your uh, rebellion, and turned to God by faith, believing that your sins can be taken away through Jesus alone? The Bible says when you put your faith in Christ and you are saved, you are given the Holy Spirit. You are made a new people, a new creation. You become a part of the body of Christ. And one of the things this text says is that God gives spiritual gifts, gifts of faith in different uh, areas and to different degrees to those who are his people. So this only applies to you if you're a Christian. Um, But I want you to see uh, the first main point in verses 3 through 6 is that God 
gives gifts to every one of his born again children, his believers, those who are adopted in Christ. So if you're in Christ right now, we talked about the gift of salvation. Now I want to talk about the gifts of the Spirit or gifts to serve the church. You have one. You might have several, but you have at least one. God gave them or it to you. And he's a good God. He gave you the gift you need. He gave you the gift you need to serve the church, the, a gift the church needs that it would not have if you were not there. So the first thing he acknowledges is that God gives these gifts. We don't get to pick our spiritual gifts, so to speak, but God gives them. They're supernatural. They're empowered by him and for him. So he says, first of all, we shouldn't boast. We shouldn't think of ourselves more highly than another brother. I believe that God has probably given me a, a gift towards evangelism. I should not look down on someone who is scared to death of evangelism, uh, but is a genuine believer and think that my gift is better than theirs or that they're inadequate because they don't have that gift. Now we should desire all the gifts, which is desire to serve in, in a little bit in every way, but we shouldn't think of ourselves one higher than the other. That gift is given. I did not become an evangelist by just working hard at it or just reading books. No, it says that to each whom God has given as a measure. Um, so any good gifts you have or spiritual growth, you ought to praise God. You ought to be humble if you're gifted at um, leadership, if you're gifted at serving, if you're gifted at contributing um, cheerfully. All of these things, speaking prophetically into someone's life, praise God. He He gives the gift. He assigns. There's a body with many different body parts, and they are all one. So Praise God for your gift tonight, whatever your spiritual gift is. Um, I'll get to how you might know what your spiritual gift is in just a moment. Um, but give God the glory for that. Thank Him. Ask Him to increase it. Um, be thankful for the gift you have. Be thankful for how God gives others differently than you that we're not all exactly the same. I don't want to be a church where everybody does exactly the same thing in exactly the same way. Some of you are going to be more gifted at hospitality than others. But know your gifting. The second is that you must use your gifts. So I think verses three through five talk about God giving the gifts. And then he says in verse six, having gifts given by God that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. So God gives the gift by his sovereign grace, but we are to respond with our free will, our own responsible actions and to serve. He gives you this gift, use it. If you're gifted at evangelism, evangelize. If you're gifted at serving, serve in the church. If you're gifted at leading, lead in the church. And so these gifts are being used, uh, especially within the body of Christ. It says, if prophecy, in proportion to your faith. If service, serve. The one who teaches, teach. The one who contributes, don't just contribute a little bit, contribute generously, giving. Some of you are able and gifted at giving more to missions and to the local church. The one who leads, leads with zeal. And the one who acts, um, does acts of mercy do that? And maybe be an encourager, or a sympathizer, a compassionate church member. Use your gifts. God gave them to you. They're supernatural. They're divine. And only you have them, maybe, even in our church. Use it. Use it. Be faithful. You've got to be in church. You've got to be calling and connecting with people. Don't sit back and wait to use your gift. He actually says, use your spiritual gift. God gave it. I need you to use your gift. This church, the kingdom, needs you. You, for your own joy, needs you to use your gift. So how will you know what your spiritual gift is? Now, there are a couple of ways God might just show you or tell you. Um, I've been a part of churches where you do spiritual gift inventory tests. I guess that's one way you can do it. I know people have been blessed by that. But here's one practical way, I think, to know what your spiritual gift is is to just start serving. Just sign up for every little thing at the church or a thing here and just try. And then see if you're good at it. You go do evangelism and it, it's just not really not your thing. At least you tried. But figure out what your gifts are by serving. Just try. Blossom where you're planted. I knew I was not gifted at shooting a basketball because when I got put in, uh, in middle school and high school, and I shot, I missed, and the coach asked me kindly, probably should pass more often. So you know what I found out? I was really good at passing. I was really fast and good at dribbling. So I was better at distributing the ball to the shooters.
But I found that out by trying to shoot or by playing with shooters or by watching others who could dribble and pass and and be a floor general. So just get on the court. Be a part of the local church in a, in a way in which you're giving and serving, not just being served. And so I would encourage you to do that. We've got to be creative in this time um, as a church and as parts of the body of Christ, even finding ways to evangelize virtually or writing letters. You might not be able to see some of our elderly folks, but you can write them letters. I know that Daisy Baker is doing a good job of that. Uh, Steve Estes is finding ways to go serve the bride that are non, uh, non-typical. non um, You can do it. Just just say, Lord, I'm willing. I want to use this gift. I want to find out when my gifts are. I want to bless your kingdom. I want to bless your bride. So just get on the court. Uh, just try to use your gifts. And then the last thing I want to think about as I talked with my children last night, um, in talking about God giving gifts, I want us, even before our children have been saved, to acknowledge that God made them each very different. I have one child that's very soft and compassionate and one that's very hard-nosed and go get them. I think God can use both of those for His kingdom. So I don't want to just say this one need to be like this one or not like this one. I want to take those gifts and foster them, encourage them so that when God saves them, they will already be able to be sanctified. So encourage diversity in the church. Encourage diversity of gifts and traits within your home and uh, encourage them by, by praising. We don't just want to praise those who evangelize. We want to praise those who serve, praise those who encourage, praise those who give uh, sacrificially. So here Paul paints a beautiful picture of a church, a church I think that Bethany is becoming more and more like every day. So let's end briefly with singing a song, one of my favorites, Be Thou My Vision. I hope you will continue watching and singing along, looking at the lyrics that I'm going to provide for you so you can visualize them and ask God to help your heart match your lips and the words you're eyes are seeing. Hope you'll enjoy.